Are live streaming apps showing us what the media won't? Twitter earnings get leaked and a new smartphone encased in leather. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 326 for Tuesday, April 28th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox. Take advantage of the existing usage and familiarity of Dropbox and don't waste time trying to find a different solution. Visit dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash business. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we talk about the tech news with the people reporting the news. I know you come here for stories about technology, and I want to give you that. But I also want to say that when I got home from work yesterday and saw everything that had been going on in Baltimore over the weekend, stemming from the death of Freddie Gray, I was kind of embarrassed about spending the day talking about whether or not you should buy the Apple Watch. I lived in Baltimore for four years. I went to college there. But I don't really understand what's going on, nor do I think this is the place, or nor do I have the qualifications to debate it. But today I saw that tech journalist Selena Larson had a piece in the Daily Dot about Baltimore. We contacted her for her take on how and what technology people are using to see beyond the images and video that most of the media is showing us right now. Welcome, Selena. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Megan. So you start your piece talking about Meerkat and Periscope. That's the live streaming apps that we talk about all the time on the show. You say that part of their promise is more live citizen journalism. Have we seen much of that in Baltimore? We haven't seen citizen journalism. There are a lot of journalists out there, especially um, there was one from The Guardian and one from Vice that have been um, periscoping basically throughout their time there. Their, their coverage has been completely live streamed. They're also obviously contributing to Twitter and Instagram and Vine. Um, but in terms of the general public, what we're seeing is they're not adopting Periscope and Meerkat in ways that some people predicted in the wake of Ferguson and other protests across the country. Um, one of these promises, you know, that you see with these live streaming applications is in times of conflict or um, disaster that the, they can sh be a way for people to find out what's going on around them and show people in real time what's happening. But what we're seeing in Baltimore this week is that people aren't necessarily using these applications. And in fact, the general interest across Twitter has sort of waned. And I took a look at Topsy data based on tweets around um, Periscope and Meerkat. And what we're seeing is it's kind of fallen off. And the peaks that you'll see are all related to celebrity tweets and celebrity um, television shows that say, hey, you know, join us on Periscope, join us on Meerkat. This is what we're going to be doing. Um, there are so few, if you take a cursory look through Twitter, um, so few right now uh, happening in Baltimore. Right. So I, I guess it's safe to say that a lot of people are using Meerkat and Periscope to talk about technology or celebrity. <laughs> Yes, definitely. So, um, I mean, again, like when it first launched, there was like this major hype, especially around South by Southwest, which was in mid-March. And there was a lot of talk, especially from VCs, tech reporters, startup founders. They were live streaming their time at South by. They were live streaming, you know, startup events, um, the fridge Fridging was a thing on Periscope right. for a while where people would just open their fridge and, and, and live stream whatever was in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was, you know, this was kind of this novelty peek into somebody's life. There wasn't really this moment where we're seeing, you know, these, these, these clashes or these protests sort of have their Twitter moment. Like we saw Twitter sort of, sort of came to its own during the Arab Spring when everyone was using it to communicate and, and really, you know, documenting what was going on around them. And in terms of the, the um, protests there on the ground, what people are relying on are Instagram video, Vine, and Twitter. And part of that is because, you know, these, these apps are still so nascent. They're having, you know, kind of a hard time leaving this bubble, but also because that's where the audience is. Their friends and family are on Instagram and Twitter and, and, and Vine. Um, they, you can see them over and over again. They don't disappear after a set number of hours. You can view them on the web and on mobile. It's just a lot more, um, a lot more easily accessible. And as uh, somebody else pointed out on Twitter, um, actually a couple people have, um, have pinged this over to me, uh, is that Android doesn't support these these features, right? So they're they're still very iOS centric. So until Android, which you know has a very large market, um, 
begins to adopt some of these features, a lot of people won't be using them. And, um, you know, like a lot of times techies or a lot of times people in Silicon Valley are very iPhone centric. So when iPhone apps launch, um, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of hype around there and we're always using them. We're always checking them out. Um, so, but not having an, an Android supported app, um, is a huge missed opportunities for, um, for times like this when, when a lot of people aren't, you know, necessarily using iPhones, they're on Android. Right. I mean, it's just a reminder that sometimes we all live in this like tech journalist bubble and we think things are going to be the biggest thing just because everyone we see is using them, but mm -hmm. everyone is not yeah, using them. Exactly. You know, and it's like, and that is, it's so easy to get, to get sort of caught up in this. Um, you know, your friends are using it. You're seeing it talked about on Twitter. You follow the same people that have similar ideas or beliefs as you do. Um, and it's very easy to forget that not everybody uses technology the same. And um, in times like these events like this, where there, there are very large protests, very large scale, Twitter turns into um, a media feed and you're seeing video, you're seeing footage, you're seeing stuff from from Baltimore that you're not seeing on CNN and you're not seeing it on on NBC or your local news. And I think that's that that to me was what was, you know, the promise of these apps that, that would be really interesting. Um, but people are still just using Instagram and Vine and, and you know, embedding it in their tweets and, and sharing it and retweeting it thousands of times. And people can see it over and over again. And it's not just going to disappear when the time runs out on Periscope. Right. So now in your research, have you have you seen that people are using their own technology to tell truer stories than the mainstream media is telling? Yeah, you know, that's kind of the narrative that we're seeing a lot of. And I think that because, you know, there's the media is is, is really, you know, consolidated as it's it's can only be in certain places. And um, what we're seeing is, you know, um, citizen journalists. And that's something that um, is, you know, it's, a, it's an idea that sort of sprung about on social media is the idea that people that are actually there on the ground are documenting what they're seeing, they're documenting their lived experiences, and they're sharing, you know, what's going on in their community through Twitter, through Facebook, um, now Vine, Instagram, and yes, eventually I'm sure Periscope and Meerkat. Um, so there, the, these are, you know, stories that the media isn't showing, you know, they're, they're videos of their brothers and sisters, they're videos of their classmates, they're showing, you know, people stopping the protesters. And in fact, a few of the tweets that I embedded in my story um, came with, along with a comment, this is not what you're going to see on CNN. And there were men standing in front of the protesters, you know, Baltimore residents saying, don't, don't give them a reason. Don't do this. Don't give them a reason. Another one was um, a video of an officer pushing a man down to the ground um, from his back and his head snapped back and um, pushing him down from behind him. And it, it, along with the caption, you know, this isn't something that you're going to see on CNN. So, because and, and and so many of these protests are, are are fueled, you know, because of um footage that's been captured on cell phone videos. This is, you know, really sparking this conversation and um the desire for people to seek justice because now, you know, you can hold people accountable and you can film that and you can say, you know, this is what's really going on, this is our story, and we can share it through Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, and it really just shows the power of video and the power of the new technologies because the way Vine works, I mean, seeing that guy being pushed down over and over again, I mean, that in itself is, um, it's it's different than just seeing it once. I mean, and so mm -hmm. I, I guess I worry a little bit about citizen journalism. I mean, who is who's showing that that wasn't staged? I mean, who's? I'm not saying that it was staged. I'm just saying who is there, like, where's the authority to say that that wasn't staged? I think about, like, uh, in... In Ferguson, there was that picture that we all saw that everyone posted on Facebook that was the officer talking to the young boy. And it was so sweet. And it was like, look, you know, everyone's getting along. And then you read deeper into it. And, you know, maybe it was staged. So, you know, I, I, I worry a little bit about that. Have you heard or read anything about, about that, about any of this stuff being a little bit faked for the camera? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's and, and that's why it's so important still to have journalists on the ground. And that's why we use these tools and like Vine and Twitter and Facebook, we use them um, as tools to help enhance our reporting. And if you see a story or you see a narrative throughout social media that's being shared over and over again, you can you can go there and visit it and find out more information. And, and you can contact these people and say, you know, like, let me talk to you. Let's hear your story. Um, I think I think the staging aspect of it isn't necessarily problem, you know, all of the good that citizen reporting does and all of the truth that we're getting out of these things is kind of, kind of cancels out, I guess, any of this like staged citizen reporting. I think, I think especially in times of crisis, in times of chaos, in times of protest, um, it's very difficult to, to stage something like that, you know, and, and try and make something like that go viral just for the sake of going viral. I think 
these tools and these services are, are so much more beneficial and so much more um, helpful and useful, not just to journalists, but to, to people to get the word out. Um, and, you know, you might see it probably tonight. You'll, you'll see it anytime there's like a large scale protest or event that's happening. And you just go to Twitter and the narrative between Twitter and Facebook and the traditional media, the mainstream media is so different. And I think that for for people that consume news and, and, and read news and information and want to know more about the world, want to know more about what's going on, I think having a steady diet and, and you know, like looking at both of those things and taking them both into consideration is very helpful to, to really understand and learn a whole comprehensive story. I totally agree. I mean, it's better than just having the one, which is what we had for so long. Um, Selena, thank you so much for coming. Selena Wright Larson is the staff writer at The Daily Dot. Where's the best people f place for people to read your work? Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously, I'm at dailydot.com, and you can feel free to tweet me at Selena Larson on Twitter. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. And someone in the chat room also pointed out that uh, Android also has Ustream, which we talked about, um, we've talked about before, which I know you know about as the live streaming app, too, that's on Android. But um, the mm -hmm. thing with, with Periscope and Meerkat is they were just so intertwined with Twitter and so easy to use that, that as I'm sure what you're talking about, that, that's why it's different than Ustream, which has been around for a while. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the social aspect was really what kind of kicked these off and, and made them sort of these conversation starters to make it so easy and so seamless. And um, and really, like, the user interface is a lot different than, than Ustream or, or these other live streaming apps. You know, it's just like the, the whole promise of them was to make them sleeker and, and easier to use and, um, and, and just, like, cleaner and, you know, these kind of, like, in, in March, they, they went crazy and they got they got super popular among, you know, different types of people and the promise of live streaming is being cool again or or it's kind of coming coming into its own thing was was there. So um, it should be interesting to see. I think once um, I think once it, it gets a little bigger, it should be interesting to see what happens. But um, I just I was personally I was really surprised at the lack of um, periscoping and meerkatting in Baltimore, especially considering um, all of the, the hype that surrounded it. Uh, in here in Silicon Valley and elsewhere in the tech world. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks again, Selena. Thanks. Take care. Coming up, Twitter earnings get released on Twitter and virtual reality on the GoPro. But first, many of you use Dropbox, and I do too. And at Twit, we also use it to sync and share files, everything from sharing audio MP3s, large graphic files, invoices, and program schedules. People in over 4 million businesses throughout the world use Dropbox. You can grow your business using Dropbox for business. It's the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and have visibility and control over your data. Dropbox for Business lets you do just that, and you don't have to waste time finding a different solution. Dropbox for Business is the same easy Dropbox experience your employees already love and trust. That means less training and more productivity. Simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with one terabyte and it's easy to expand. Staff can collaborate with team members, securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients and vendors. And most importantly for IT professionals, you have control. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing and permission controls plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure only the right people get access to some sensitive company data. Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administration. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. Extra security features are available like single sign-on and two-step verification. If you want to give it a try, take advantage of your employees' familiarity with Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash business. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Twitter earnings were leaked about an hour early today using an amazing tool designed to wildly disseminate powerful information as quickly as possible. Maybe you've heard of this tool, it's called Twitter. And today Twitter proved once again that what they do is not worth nearly as much to the rest of the world as it is to all the journalists on Twitter. Financial results for the first quarter were weaker than expected and according to Bloomberg, the stock fell 18%, due in no small part to the aforementioned leak. Active user growth is up, but apparently not enough up to impress investors who see improved growth and better credibility in Facebook and Google. 
Today, smartphone maker LG officially lifted the embargo on their newest phone, the G4. Many of the details about the phone have already been leaked. It has a leather back engineered like a fancy designer handbag. It includes 5.5-inch screen with a new quantum display. It features a 16-megapixel front camera and an 8-megapixel camera for your selfies. CNET says it's worth the upgrade from the G3 to the G4, but whether most people will prefer it to other luxury smartphones like the Samsung Galaxy X S6 or the iPhone 6, that remains to be seen. Today, wearable camera company GoPro released extreme earnings. First quarter earnings rose 52%, and the stock has nearly doubled since its initial public offering of $24 last June. Recode also reports that GoPro just bought a French software company called Color, that's with a K. They create virtual reality videos that people can watch online, even without virtual reality goggles. And more gripping news from the front lines of the Apple App Store review process. Last week, we reported that Apple was rejecting apps just because they listed support for the Pebble Watch as part of their features list. Apparently, this was not intentional. Apple confirmed to Wired that this was a mistake and the company has not changed its policy toward accepting apps with Pebble support now that they've released the Apple Watch. So you can breathe easy if you have a Pebble. But if you're looking to develop an app for the Apple Watch that tells time better than the Apple Watch, look elsewhere. Apple Insider points directly to a new addition to the App Store review guidelines, which says that Apple will reject watch apps if their sole purpose is to tell the time. And finally, we all understand that the selfie stick is bananas because it replaces something we already have, arms. But Petapixel reports that you can now buy a selfie stick that's shaped like an arm. That's right. This selfie stick is not unlike the popular Invisible Boyfriend app that will text you so you can convince friends and families that you're dating someone. For those of you listening to the audio version, it this is exactly what you think it is. It's a mannequin arm that holds your phone on one hand and lets you hold a plastic zombie-looking hand on the other. The prototype was created by artists Justin Crow and Eric Snee out of lightweight and portable fiberglass. And it's creepy and weird, and I kind of want one. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us. We love your feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.